Good evening. I'm Malcolm Young, Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, California. Welcome to the Forum Winter Season. My guest tonight is Patricia Williams, one of the most important intellectuals in American law and a pioneer of both the law and literature and critical race theory movements in American legal theory. She is the University Distinguished Professor of Law and Humanities at Northeastern University and Director of Law, Technology and Ethics Initiatives. Her award-winning column, Diary of a Mad Law Professor, appeared in Nation Magazine for two decades, and she is the recipient of seven honorary doctorates and a MacArthur Fellowship. She is the author of six books, including The Alchemy of Race and Rights, which was named one of the feminist classics of the last 20 years that, quote, literally changed women's lives, end quote, by Ms. Magazine, and one of the 10 best nonfiction books of the decade by Amazon.com. Tonight, we mark the beginning of Black History Month with a conversation about Pat's most recent book, Giving a Damn, Racism, Romance, and Gone with the Wind, and how when you begin to unpick current debates about immigration, freedom of speech, the culture wars, and wall building, beneath them lies the unexamined history of enslavement in the West. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're delighted to have you. Um, and what a pleasure after ha having all these decades of, of kind of being peripherally connected in our, through our families' lives. And then certainly you've been a major feature in our, in our reading and intellectual life at our household. Uh, I was looking back through um, Alchemy and, and there it, it's almost like doing an archeological dig because there's different layers of annotations that my wife made um, from different times she read it and different ones that I made. Uh, and, you know, one of the most embarrassing annotations in the book is one where uh, you are talking about um, reconceptualizing from objective truth to rhetorical event. And you describe a conversation between two of your faculty colleagues um, and how one has this like other critic in mind who would uh, criticize the argument in a particular way. And in the margins, uh, my wife wrote my initials <laughs> as, you know, maybe somebody who's who's guilty of doing the same kind of thing, making a, a being overly critical of someone's use of of, of language and style. But I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your, your choices about style and, and how you address your audience and how do you how do you reach people? What are some of the questions that you have as you imagine your audience in, in, in writing your books? Oh, um. Well, thank you for that very warm introduction. And um, I, I, it's such a pleasure to see you and your wife again. I, I mean, behind that introduction is the fact that we met 30 years ago. <laughs> and um, it's such a delight um, to see you in this context. I, um, the, the, my focus on language is 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 an effort at precision. I you know because I think that what I try to do is something that is an effort to deal with the fact that so much of the divisiveness of this moment, when about race, is about a concept that doesn't exist, but yet has such material consequence. So therefore, it is about something that is spoken into being or is written into being. Um, and that arranges our concepts in ways that put blinders on our sense of possibility. And hence my emphasis on language, not just on arguing in um, uh, uh, you know, with a, without a sense of deep, deep context. It seems to me that a lot of what divides us is a lack of context, a lack of particularity, um, as well as bad faith and mean spiritedness. But um, so my audience, I think, is to people of goodwill who want to figure out how we invoke histories without a precise consciousness of what we're invoking. And that there's a kind of what I think of as a kind of echo or echolalia in embedded in historical events that when you peel back the layers, well, where did that come from? Where did that come? Almost like a um, maybe an historical thesaurus, you know, working one's way back in time to the to, um, to the uh, to the bare bones of what um, of what the social relations were that were embedded in law or embedded in particular social habits or just embedded in particular turns of phrase and the etymology of particular words. So, 
Yeah. You know, I um, pulled out my old copy of uh, Martha Nussbaum's book, Love no Loves Knowledge, um, today. And she writes, um, certain truths about human life can only be fittingly stated in the language of the narrative artist. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how literature is useful in illuminating issues having to do with race. We talked about Toni Morrison a little bit early but, um, when we were off camera before. Um, but I, I wonder about how um, you as a literary artist and other literary artists help illuminate, illuminate issues having to do with law and the race. Oh, um, I thank you for <laughs> the uh, appellation of literary or, or, or narrative artist. I like that. Um, but I, when I think of Toni Morrison, I, I've been thinking a lot about um, the effort to ban books um, that has somehow resurged um, so tragically in this country and so forcefully and so suddenly. And one of the books most banned or removed from school libraries in the United States right now is Toni Morrison's book, Beloved. Yeah. Um, even when Beloved first came out, I was always surprised that many of the reviewers talked about it like a ghost story, that it's a ghost story. But it's really so much more than that. It's so much richer. It is a history of trauma. I mean, it's a fictional narrative of a semi-dream world that is specifically about the effects of trauma. And if one, again, peels a layer beneath that, it is specifically the trauma uh, that occurred in the life of a real person, Margaret Garner, and her trial. And Margaret Garner was a slave who escaped from a plantation in Kentucky. Um, she was owned by a man named Archibald Gaines. Um, she had had or been raped by him repeatedly and had two children, at least, I think, by him. And she escaped with those children, with three of her children, um, to Ohio. Um, when the bounty hunters came to return her under the Fugitive Slave Act, and the Fugitive Slave Act allowed and sort of federalized um, the slave interests by allowing um, slave catchers to be provided with bounties to chase back the escaped property, the inventory of slave owners. Um, and when they came to her door, she attempted to kill all three of her children rather than have them go back into bondage. And uh, I think she successfully killed one, but she was taken um, and there was a there was a, a there was an attempted trial in 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 Ohio, um, and the interesting part about that is that if she had been allowed to be tried for murder, she would have been recognized mm -hmm. under the law of the free state of Ohio as a human being, as an agent, as somebody culpable, and under the laws of the South, <laughs> of the slave states, um, that's she was in a very different status. Under the Fugitive Slave Act, she was escaped property. She was a th she was chattel. She was a thing. She was not fully human. And so there was a contest first, not of the trial of what happened to the dead baby, but her status of whether or not she would be tried. And the abolitionist lawyers were actually trying to have her tr tried for murder because that would mm -hmm. um, acknowledge something in terms of the larger question of slave humanity. And, uh, but that did not happen and she was returned. And it's really, she was described as being returned, almost boxed up and sent like a UPS package back to Kentucky and back to her owner. And, uh, and so that history as being the nightmare and the echoing trauma that Toni Morrison writes about in that book uh, is, is, is certainly why Toni Morrison certainly deserves the title of narrative artist in terms of conveying the 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 um, the collective trauma, the echoing historical trauma, um, and the interior life that I think is so often unacknowledged of people who have endured torture and bondage, repeated rape, and uh, it, it, it 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 it's about it's 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 an ultimate story of of humanity um, struggling to 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 claim its its vivacity as human. And to survive, I, I remember reading it as, as, as part of our seminary education. 
Um, and just, just being so amazed by how powerful it was in conveying that experience. You know, your own work has been banned. Your own writing has been banned. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what that feels like maybe first. And then maybe, um, you know, if you were to meet somebody who was on a school board who was deciding whether or not to ban a work or a library board, or, you know, we, we talked a little bit about privatizing libraries before. If you could talk to somebody who was intent on banning books, what would you say to them? I almost, I, I mean, it's, you know, it, books about race, race is like talking about sex. It's, you know, it's, now we're also not talking about sex or anything else, but yeah. it, you know, it, it's, it makes people squirrely and weird and, and, and squirmy. Um, that said, it's a very different thing when the law intervenes and says, you can't teach this. Um, and when, as in Florida, books that parents have complained about are marked in very specific ways, so they're inaccessible. Um, and that, you know, when that happens, I think we've entered a different world than simply, you know, a teacher or even a school saying this is inappropriate for our kids. Um, uh, this brings us back to McCarthyism. But I think that it's actually what we're going through now is potentially worse than McCarthyism uh, because the way in which SB 8 in Texas or the Stop Woke Act in Florida has enacted, you can't talk, teachers can't talk about it in their offices. Mm -hmm. In Florida, it also, and I, I, I'm not certain, there may be a case that has actually suspended the um, uh, the law for graduate school, um, graduate public schools. But um, I know that that part of the problem is in Florida is that you can't even talk about, you know, the you know, critical race theory or what it deals with there, which is part of the constitution. It's part of constitutional law. You can't deal with race, even in your office. You can't talk with students about it anywhere. You can't talk about it in public libraries. And um, and the way in which it's enforced is that you have this sort of distributed agency. You basically have the equivalent of vigilantes in the name of so-called parental freedom, that when a parent complains about it, then the book can be at least suspended, if not ultimately banned. And then a committee... Um, which is appointed by the governor, who just doesn't want race talked about at all, who has decided that the AP class has the AP um, intervention, its entire curriculum is of, quote, no educational value. Um, this incredible breadth is, it seems to me, even beyond what I think it's beyond anything we've seen in recent American history, perhaps going back to the Black Codes or Jim Crow, but really the Black Codes, where it was forbidden to allow African Americans or certain others to testify in court or to be heard. And it, it strikes me and many <laughs> as an extension of the anti-literacy laws, which forbade not only African Americans to learn to read, but would punish anybody who taught slaves to read. And, uh, uh, and, it, and, and it seems that this is an extension in which anything that pertains to African-American history can be pulled. And if you think I'm overstating, <laughs> it's really interesting to look at PEN America, the writer's organization. Right. It's list of banned books. There are thousands of banned books. And for some of them, there can be no other reason except that it's about African Americans. Wynton Marsalis's book, oh which is, a, I think the title is like, um, you know, it's like shush, bang, boom, and it's about the sounds that a jazz orchestra makes. And it's for young children. Yeah. There is nothing, you know, <laughs> about right. um, politics. There's nothing about, you know, I, I, I don't even, you know, it, it's, but yet it's, it's been, the books by um, Sonia Soto, Soto, Justice Sonia Sotomayor's um, children's book written in Spanish for, uh, you know, as, as, which describes her own, you know, path to success, banned. Um, 
So it's not just my books, um, which break my heart. It really does break my heart. Um, but it's a, a kind of incomprehensible overcapaciousness in which what began as a discussion of specific history of laws, like anti-literacy laws, right. uh, among lawyers and law school educators in seminars specifically addressing this um, about the jurisprudence of you know, what we used to call integration, <laughs> of being coming part of um, the polity um, and the degree to which that has been bastardized. That's the only word I can think of by a very mean-spirited, bad faith campaign. And so I, what I would tell people who are confused by this is A, to read the books that have been banned. I mean, I've suggested you know, you know a banned bookmobile. That would, that <laughs> I love would, that. That's great. You know, there is, <laughs> because some of them are really shockingly um, inoffensive by any measure. Yeah. Um, and so that's one place to begin. But I also think it's really important to read the origin of this particular attack on critical race theory a, two years ago. Nobody knew what critical race, race theory was. It was not a popular anything. Yeah. You know, it was, again, very limited. There were a series of books written under that rubric. There are, you know, 10 to 12 people, including myself, listed on Wikipedia as associated with this conversation. Yeah. Um, but President Trump issued an order saying that critical race theory is a poison and must be eradicated at all costs, and people should lay down their lives to eradicate it. This is terrifying. So that's, I mean, you ask my feelings, you know, this is an invitation to the kinds of I don't know, conspiracy craziness that has no relation to anything that I know of or any of the, you know, of what were originally critical race here. It, it, it bears no relation to, what, to anything that we've written. Um, I also think that it, what one should really read is the statement by Christopher Rufo, who was the muse for Donald Trump's statement, executive order now revoked, but nevertheless, uh, Christopher Rufo is now on Ron DeSantis's team of in an attempt to federalize the the the, the Stop Woke Act in in in, in Florida, and um, he specifically said, "I wanted to take something and rebrand it." I wanted to make it something that would be associated with everything Americans fear. Um, I wanted to make it associated with everything horrible in America and then to sell that. So it is a very conscious act of propaganda to defame in the, you know, to other political ends. So I feel like those of us who were really genuinely earnest about the scholarship of, that began as the project of integration with the civil rights movement um, have been instrumentalized. We are sort of objects in this larger political war um, that has nothing to do with anything we've written. Yeah. So it, It's, um, and it's very hard to respond in a coherent fashion because you, because you, you, there's this double level. I can tell you what I think of cr as critical race theory, but the term has been so corrupted that it's impossible to talk to people without their thinking it's about child pornography, it's about grooming children, it's about, um, hating, uh, it's, it's about hating white people, it's about making white people hate themselves. <sighs> and 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 so I, you know, I have written my entire career in an effort, you know, <laughs> to, to, you know, I, you know, I, I used to be mocked as kumba, Miss Kumbaya. <laughs> you know, it, it's like, it was an effort to make the world a better place, and to see this work now being instrumentalized um, in a sort of gaseous cloud of fantasy. 
um, you know, how do you respond to something that um, has no coherent referent? Yeah. And so, you know, to I, back to language, yeah, you, this you is this. Yeah, this is a corruption of language itself. It is, it is. And you, you haven't read your books recently, but they're, you're, you're incredibly empathetic. I, I mean, uh, one of my favorite sections is, it's just like a little, it's like a tiny little paragraph, but it's, it's a side comment. And you're basically talking about um, the, the white flight from your neighborhood as a child. And, and, and you're sympathizing with how disruptive that must have been for, for the people whose racism undermined their sense of self and made them fearful and, and moved them to other places. It, it's really, it's really beautiful. I, I mean, so I can see how your friends and colleagues would describe you as the kumbaya lady, because it, it, and it's so important that empathy and love and concern for other people. Um, it, it's exactly the opposite of what you describe as being, um, as being um, caricatured by, by that um, propaganda movement. I, I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about um, Uncle, um, about Charles Lawrence's essay. He's, he's got a, a recent essay called The Fire This Time, which starts out with him uh, going and doing his law school interview. So uh, in the old days, Yale University, you'd have to go and interview with the dean of the law school. And the, the, one of the um, questions that the law school dean would ask is, well, what have you been reading lately? And um, so uh, 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 Charles Lawrence said, I've been reading um, uh, um, James Baldwin, uh, the, you know, The Fire Next Time. And the, the law professor said, well, what did you think of it? And, you know, instantly, um, Uncle Chuck is thinking, you know, what do I say? You know, and then the, the law dean is talking about, oh, well, uh, we had some, uh, we had a, uh, we have a black friend who, and this is what the black friend says. And I've read about, I haven't read the book itself, but I've read the reviews in the New York Times. I mean, it was just all those classical things. Things. And and I think of um, I think of critical legal theory as beginning in moments like that, and, and I wonder if you can talk about what the what the the genesis of, of of this important work is, and just kind of describe what the early days were like as as you and and, and other very um, uh, powerful thinkers were beginning to struggle with the way that the, that race is, is so uh, racism is so deeply embedded in law. Yeah, and 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 not just law, but I mean, it, it is the language. You say classic moments like that. It is this. It is you know, it is a mistaking of the singular for the plural, or the yes. plural for the singular, and uh, you know, it it is a misuse of the indicative. So, you know, I I, there, I think Roger Cohen wrote us an article recently about you know. A manual of style that some journalists use, and the manual cautioned against using the the indicative because it really does imply a sort of plural when you're talking about something which maybe is less than a plural. And so, you know, I think immediately of people who talk about the blacks, the Jews, you know, that that use of the and uh, is is something which aggregates in a way. And aggregates a population that is much more varied than it ought to be. Um, and so, you know, an example of that might be, for example, the shooting in Monterey, the, the tragic, tragic shooting in Monterey Bay, in which it's, you know, the Asians. But, you know, if you actually look at, you know, it was a Chinese community which was attacked by a man whose name at least is Vietnamese. Yes. And the degree that the Asians become all one community uh, may not take into account that there are other histories involved in the encounter. Um, again, this is, please do not understand, is, this is any kind of excuse, but the layering of, of um, the way in which different communities have different histories that come together in the United States, uh, the, the uh, you know, the Blacks in certain populations when I lived in New York, you know, you know, didn't really explain the kind of frictions between, for example, Dominicans and African American descendants of slaves, or uh, Puerto Ricans and um, uh, Brazilians, and but somehow everybody was Hispanic, which is a linguistic category, but not, um, but doesn't account for all the little cultural nuance that might 
um, allow for interventions that would understand the frictions at a, at a, at a more nuanced level is, 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 is what I'm saying. And I, th so I think that those, and, and to go back to the Roger Cohen article, um, it became caught up in what strikes me as a very silly debate about the French, about whether the French, you know, why is somebody making such a big uh, deal about using the term the French? Well, partly because it's not usually marked in the destructive way that the blacks or the Jews might be, but the idea that the indicative is a is used in a way that is relative to context, and that, that context may shift depending upon how you use that indicative, is really, it seems to me, an important part of the sophistication of what of how language can be used, and that when we dismiss it as simply silly, you know, and, and that's certainly the way in which that, I think, you know, there's been a big debate about whether or not this isn't another example of wokeism to be conscious of the use of the, this kind of singularizing indicative, the, um, I think we miss opportunities to talk about, to, that are the portals to the deeper sense of really, maybe I'm thinking it, everybody is one clump, you know, and it, it's, it's easy enough. It's not, and if we, and if all we're doing is fighting about the fact that this can never be a serious argument, um, the the level of dismissiveness, the refusal to take, um, you know, to, to hear our conversations in this, um, to appreciate to appreciate the the habits of language that that you know sometimes are minor, but sometimes might excavate something really interesting in and in, and. In, and reorganizing of our thought. How did you find yourself just drawn to this this area of scholarship? I mean, um, what was the beginning of your interest, and and you know, uh, how did how did you, have your ideas developed over time? Um, I think, you know, this area of scholarship. I was actually, you know. It, well, you made it's, it and you invented it. <laughs> I, 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 but I'm a contracts teacher. I began teaching contract yeah, law. Yeah. Um, but I also started writing outside of contract, outside of the, I, I didn't really start in law. I started writing essays about my experience of being the first, always the first. Yeah. I mean, how many times can one be a first? <laughs> it was like, you know, it, there were so few of us in law school. And not just African Americans. There were so few women when I was in law school. Exactly. Um, these were conversations that came up out of necessity. Um, when I was in law school, I think I was the last year, the first semester, we had what was called Ladies' Day, in which um, our professors would throw powder puffs out to the to, to the ladies in the class one day a month, oh, and they would throw them what we call powder puff questions. Oh. Um, and otherwise, women weren't called on. So, you know, the conversation was started for us. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's famous experience with being invited to dinner um, because they were so few and then told that they weren't going to be as productive as men because they were going to be reproductive. <laughs> you know? okay. that, that, so I think our, our, our presence was always being questioned. Uh, and so one developed answers for that. I write everything that I that that vexes me. Yeah. And so those became the first essays. And so I don't think that I came to it. It was brought to me when, right, right. when you're in elite circles and um, circumstances uh, hire them on you. Yeah, exactly. No. The other part of it is that I grew up in a neighborhood that my mother had grown up, that my grandmother had grown up. But uh in you know, when I was small, white flight occurred. And so um, I think that essay to which you refer was when not just the parents, but the small children were ripped from their friends in the name of all of a sudden you have to be afraid. Yes. And I remember the daughter of my mother's best friend, that's how old, you know, they, they, how long they'd been in the neighborhood. The daughter of my mother's best friend was my age. And suddenly she was talking about how she just... She was afraid of colored people and she had to hold her breath around colored people. And I said, but, but, but I'm colored. She said, no, you're different. You're different. And so it, it really, and even at the age of eight or nine, it was brought to me that there was something incredibly incoherent, but deeply powerful 
um, that there were two sides of the brain at work. Yes, I am your friend. You know me. I am your friend. You know, we are best friends. We share our dolls. But at the same time, there's a category of me that you are so afraid of that you have to hold your breath around. And because, you know, you're afraid it's it's like cooties. You know, I think race, even among adults, operates like cooties. cooties. You know, if you're around it and if you breathe it in, you'll be contaminated, but you're not exactly sure what the disease is. You know, cooties is always undefined. You know, it's not yeah, nothing. That's exactly what it is. is. Well, the thing that's under the skin that is. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, what's happening in this country is the is the pollination of a kind of fear that operates like cooties um, um, and anger. Uh, you know, it's, it's you know, it, it's it's like Christopher Rufo has urged people have assigned <clears throat> all crime, all sex, all sex predation um, and um, a nostalgia for a world before anybody talked about the difficulties of our of our history. And there is a nostalgia is a fantasy of the past that never was. Yeah. And um, and it, and it's you know this this you know I I used to think I was being a little hyperbolic but I'm reading um a book by Victor Klemper who was a linguist um in I I believe he lived in Austria. He was Jewish. He was the conductor Otto Klemper's right. brother. And uh, and he writes as a professor about the change that occurred during the years leading up to Hitler's takeover, and but the anti-Semitism, the urging of um, uh, the, leading up to the firing of professors in universities, um, the uh, the disdain of you know Jews have nothing to teach us. So they took all the books out of the library. Um, you know, but th there was a moment at which suddenly all of that accumulated disdain and hatred, you have nothing to teach us, um, became, you know, the, the kind of massive book burning. But it's worth reading the stages just before literally everything was taken off the shelves, because it is chillingly similar, I think, to what's happening now. Well, in what and, you said uh, in the uh, in giving a damn, you describe Hitler's speeches too as being um, a way of of you know someone may have you know more open minded views, they may love their Jewish neighbor, um, but being in a stadium with thousands of other people chanting, it, it changes their reality. And it, 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 as you were as I was reading that in the book, I, I thought about Donald Trump's rallies and in what effect they have not just on people who are there, but anybody who's um, affected by them. You know. Yeah. yeah, there's a community in in this kind of you know in particular elements of Donald Trump's rhetoric and uh, in, in particular um, and uh, and in large and, and Hitler certainly was aware and maximized the propagandistic value of having large numbers of people come coming together, chanting, almost hypnotized. And uh, it, it bypasses a certain, you know, the, the brain space of reason and proportion and, and certain kinds of logic. And it becomes, uh, it's more important to um, adhere um, because that's where the pleasure center is. is right, touched. right. It's like it becomes about belonging and identity. Um, and, yeah. and, and that's a, a terif terrifying thing. You know, I, I remember the television when I, that I watched as a child. Um, I just remember it was just it was a terribly racist, like everything on TV, um, things that were especially that were from the 50s and the 60s and that were rebroadcast. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your early memories of of, of television and the media and their connection to race. Um. I, I grew up in an unusual family. My parents hated television, so we mm -hmm. never got to watch television, actually. Uh -huh. I mean, I grew up, in, I mean, we had a television, but we would be able to watch one program a week. Um, and that was usually, I mean, it was, 
I think we watched Ed Sullivan or something. I was going to ask, what was the show? <laughs> I, I grew up, you know, I think we finally broke my parents down because the Beatles came to town and the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan. And so we were permitted to watch Ed Sullivan every Saturday from there. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad that so, you, you prevailed. It, yeah, yeah. But I do remember that, that uh, while we didn't, we were not regular television watchers, um, my parents, you know, recorded and talked about every new program that had a black person anywhere in it because yeah. because you're right these there was a transformation at a certain point in time when there were no blacks at all anywhere except you know Beulah or you know the sort of gone right, with the wind exactly. stereotypes yeah. half dancers or you know uh bojangles um uh and um amos and andy uh but i think there were, the, you know, ours was a family that sat down and t- my parents really talked about the significance of the um, integration of Woolworths, the integration of television, the history of um, uh, of why Bill Cosby's being on I Spy and being a law enforcement officer of sorts or a spy yes. was so shocking you know (laughs) that he was in a position of power right Um, and uh and 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 so i I do remember you know julia you know the you know a professional black woman being depicted the the symbolic the conversation of of the the tension of 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 what television could produce in terms of symbolism um and aspiration was a conversation that you know i think continues to this day that certainly you know we had hoped had its loveliest flowering in the election of Barack Obama. Um, and again, uh, how I feel is just heartbroken that uh, that kind of symbolism is being uh, um, plowed under. Um, yeah. yeah, It is heartbreaking. You know, in um, Alchemy, um, you write about your great, great grandmother, and I wonder if you could talk about what it felt like when you first learned her story, or if you remember when it was that you first learned it, or if it was just part of your family culture and lore um, from the time before you were a child. I think like many, you know, like many African-Americans, and again, I have a longer sense of that history than many families, because my family were pack rats. <laughs> so, you know, they, they, they kept everything, papers, curricula, um, notes. Uh, you know, the moment they were released from slavery, they ran to the north, um, uh, and were and and those who didn't immediately were very influenced by Ida B. Wells. My grandmother went to the same college that Ida B. Wells did, and could hardly wait to get out of Tennessee, which is where my mother's side of the family was from. And uh, I knew very little about the generation before my great grandmother, um, and like many African-American families, that was the generation that was raped. That was the generation of women. My great-great-grandmother, of whom I wrote, um, if there was any mention, people didn't talk about her. And I think I put in alchemy that uh, the only thing I knew about her was that she was considered lazy by my great-aunts and that she sat by the river all day and fished. And it wasn't until my sister actually went to the National Archives when she was working in DC and found what we think is is the contract of sale um, of her. And she was purchased from Kentucky and taken to Tennessee by a man who was in his thirties. And the family lore, the the, the rumor was that he had purchased her to practice on because he was going to be married soon. Mm -hmm. And he was going to be married to um, a, a widow in the neighborhood. And Certainly in the census, um, this child whom he purchased at the age of 11, by the age of 12 and a half, had a child on the census so that she had been impregnated very quickly. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, you know, it, it was with that documentation, which was after both my sister and I were out of law school, so it must have been in my mid to late 20s that I that I discovered this document that I real it, it it hit me like a like a like a punch in the gut when I realized that even her 
descendants, even her daughters and granddaughters, remembered it as um, remembered her as lazy and what I think of now is clearly deeply depressed. Everything they say is that she didn't talk to people, um, that she was lazy and odd, and she must have been so depressed, purchased away from her family, um, impregnated, delivering a child, delivering a child. Um, and uh, and then her children taken away to be house servants um, because they were light skinned and quote pretty you know and and that you know that whole horrible history um, which disguises family relation it disguises and and that was the moment and that's why I wrote that book when I realized that this man whom my family remembered as the master <laughs> was actually my great great grandfather. Right. And this vocabulary, you know, redescribes, you know, it 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 uses the language of commodification, of master, of ownership, of control and agency and the ability to buy and sell that disguises, you know, this is this is child abuse. This is, you know. It's and and yet that was a systematized part of plantation life. She was inventory. She increased his wealth by her birth, and this was a habit of so many slave plantation owners that now I guess we're not supposed to talk about. Um, but it seems to me that we, in order to heal at all, we need we need to realize that this was a system that destroyed black and white, yeah. rich and poor, monsters and uh, the enslaved bodies um, who became the object of whimsical desires and 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 power to which they could not speak back. And this is not to make children feel badly. Yeah. Or, no, and I mean it's still it's, with us in every way. I mean, I think um, even our, our for all of us. It, exactly. This is broken really destructive family relationship for all of us. Yeah. And you can think of, I mean, like the incarceration crisis in America, I mean, is directly connected to this. Even I think uh, our our ability to kind of write people who are living on the streets off, our in, massive differences in income inequality, uh, you know, homelessness. It, it's all about kind of being able to shut off that part of us that treats other people as human beings. And, and for, 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 you know, the, for 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 centuries, the country was built on the the effort to try to do that to switch off another person's humanity. You know, um, you were talking about just how you're not doing it to like you know, you, you, know, um, for, you know to change children's perspectives or anything. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just um, moments in your presentations, like when people have responded in, in a kind of adverse way, like what makes people angry about your message? Because to me, it's, it's a message of, of love, a message of the possibility of, 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 of reconciliation and healing, you know, so what makes people mad about, you know, about things that you say? Well, one thing you said, I just wanted to take issue with it. You said that I'm yeah. not trying to change children's perspectives. I do want to change everybody's perspective. I do too. I That's agree. what makes people mad. Yeah. I, do. I guess, I mean, I, I guess I what um, it was Plato, it was Plato accused of like perverting the children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that you mentioned that, that being kind of like your, your crime also. <laughs> yeah. But I want them, you know, I want people, human beings, you know, to, you know, and I think the only way you can do that is to grow up together is to know each other. You know, yeah. the beginning of my little friend, you know, who moved away, there was a part of her who just saw me as a human being because we had grown up since birth together. Yeah. You know, and that's the, that is the, you know, the perception that one wants all of us to have, that we grow up in a culture where we look different, you know, we come from different cultures, but we exchange and talk about our difference and we we learn to love one another or we learn to be accustomed to one another and if we don't like each other you know we leave each other alone or we you know that we that we move through the world without a sense of uh what what i what i and that's that's what i don't want to you know convey is that collectively um a category whether it be black white young old is responsible for you know for history we 
we are the products of history <laughs> and we're responsible for making life better from here on out. And that's, and, and we can only do that by knowing, by seeing the, by seeing the trail of history, by understanding how recursive um, uh, this feeling is. I mean, I remember I, I, I was in Britain and I, I got an award in Britain and um, there was a, and actually it was, it was, it was on Martin Luther King Day as celebrated in Britain. And one of the bishops there actually came and apologized to me on behalf of all white people. <laughs> I, said, I said, I am so moved by the gesture, but yeah. it's so not what I think this effort is about. And I've got to say, I'm not about to apologize on behalf of all black people. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I think it's that way, this habitual way in which when we're not accustomed to speaking across boundary, these imagined boundaries um, that uh, we inappropriately speak or mistake the plural for the singular and the singular for the plural, um, or we mistake, you know, the whole range of white people for specific events in our collective shared history. You know, if you want to apologize to me for, you know, the acts of you know, the, the the Church of England, for example, that's something that that might lead to a more nuanced description of a particular event that isn't about your behavior or my behavior, but it's an historical phenomenon um, that we can discuss together um, as in, in terms of how each, are the, each of us are the inheritors of that. But, um, uh, you know, it, it is absolutely not what uh, I think anybody in you know, legal academia, um, anybody who is sincerely seeking a kind of civil civil rights recuperation, remedi remediation, um, um, collective reconciliation is seeking. Yeah. Um, We're it, talking a lot about me. reparations in San Francisco. I wonder if you if you have any, I mean, thoughts about reparations and, and just kind of what, how do you perceive that? I mean, I... I think that to the extent, I mean, reparations is such a vexed word to lawyers. Yeah. Um, and so I think that I, I I understand the reparations movement as a movement for repair. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the way in which law is constructed, reparations is usually an action related somehow to tort, which usually involves a specific history with a specific victim where some of the victims are still alive and you repay some amount either in punitive damages or for the loss of real estate. I think the most successful reparations actions in the United States are for uh, people who were cheated out of housing or couldn't get into housing and you can actually track the policies and the relation to, to specific losses. Um, and so I tend to think of reparations in a broader sense than just what the law would, would you know, like repairing, uh, you know, things that were stolen by Nazis during the, you know, against Jews who are still alive or their descendants who can be identified. Slavery was just, I mean, it, it, it's, and so that's why I believe that affirmative action is a form of reparations. And it's a repair that extends generationally across the board. And it really addresses the real harm, which is how we perceive African-Americans, how we perceive color in this country. And for it seems to me how we immediately impute racial hierarchy, and that's something which is so much more diffuse. But it's the core of what's so horrible about the divisions in this country that it's that it is um, that is at it's attitudinal and it's it's about it's a sensorium of repulsion and aversion, like my little friend who wanted to hold her breath. Yes, and. The repair for that, it seems to me, is that you have to be in each other's presence until that wears off or wears down, or you suddenly hear the other human being as a um, as a as a human being. I remember when I was studying psychology in college, and it was in the context of pregnancy in the 1950s that pregnant women were supposed to hide themselves. Prior to that, in our history, we've forgotten this, you know, and and. And so they did a psychological experiment of a pregnant woman coming on an elevator in a business office. 
and people would stare and they'd stare and they couldn't take their eyes off the baby bun. I mean, it was a very different time than now. Yes. <laughs> and, but, you know, but what, the, but they actually, you know, they, they, they took data about how long it took for people to get used to the fact of pregnant, pregnant woman in their midst. And then their eyes would slowly meet their, you know, they would, they would move right. upwards and they would encounter <laughs> the human being, you know, they would, they would say, okay, I've gotten over my panic. I've gotten over the fact that this is so unusual and now I can look in your eyes. And we're so, I mean, that seems it, it's, it's, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but it does seem to me that that's what needs to happen on a massive scale. And that's why I'm a, still a deep believer in affirmative action um, that uh, as, as a way of accustoming ourselves in a country where we are the most diverse country on the planet, um, particularly in terms of people coming from different cultures and encountering each other de novo, and that's such a rich resource of human understanding potentially, but yet we have a country in which most white people have no black friends or no black neighbors, or if they have one, they keep proffering them. I have a black friend and my <laughs> black friend and that becomes generalized as the black gospel. <laughs> and, and, and that seems to me, again, testament to how, how, how much we do not know each other. Um, I've benefited tremendously from affirmative action. And um, just because, uh, you know, the University of California at Berkeley, um, so by, by state mandate, it was abolished by the, by the um, regents. And the um, experience of people who followed after me um, was, was, was impoverished because of the abolition of those um, affirmative action programs. Um, so I, I agree with you. It, we, our greatest strength is how different we are. And, and the only way we can realize that strength is actually if we are are, are, are mixed with one another, if we can know one another, if we can learn and our, our greatest, stories. Our greatest, yeah. our greatest gift is also how much the same we are. Exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, in your, um, in, gosh, I think it's alchemy, um, you mentioned about your family's role in establishing um, Black Episcopal churches. Um, and I wanted yes. to talk about, yeah, I know, I love that. <laughs> we had. I, um, I lived in San Francisco some years ago and went to Grace Cathedral well before you, well before oh, Jane yes. Shaw, also yes. a mutual friend of yeah. Uh, Angela Davis was here um, and preached uh, a month, two months ago, and talked about just the importance of the Episcopal Church in her family's life. And I, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about about your own faith, or or, or um, you know what you see is, is church's strengths in, in helping to bring about the society where we do begin to get to know each other. Um, I, I, I. I really, you know, I I was raised in the Episcopal Church, um, uh, at, you know, two generations ago, just out of slavery. My, um, you know, there was this somewhat complicated <laughs> relationship to the white family that had owned, so-called, my my mother's people, um, but uh, the 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 white woman who was the mistress of the house. Um, and, and one can see this in other histories. There, there are lots of histories that this happening throughout the, you know, that, that, that in order to really lower the temptation of white husbands for, you know, uh, Black women, um, there was a real push in some communities, households, plantations um, to bring religion after slavery, after, you know, after, after um, the ban again, the act, uh, after anti-literacy um, governance um, to bring religion to black populations. And the Episcopal church was part of that. And that's what, uh, that's what my family, they began, um, uh, an Episcopal church in Tennessee, mm. um, very close. And it was, but it was, it was obviously part of Jim Crow. It was part of, it was a black Episcopal church. I, I was, I was raised in Boston. I, and, you know, my family came from the South, moved to Boston and were very involved in the Episcopal church um, um, for, for, for all the time we have been in Boston. I am 
uh, somewhat lapsed, <laughs> but, <laughs> but about I mean, but but the thing I love about the Episcopal service, and I was reading something in the paper about sort of the new religious nationalism that's yeah. that's in the that, that that is in the United States is that there is no more prayer for peace in some parts of the country or in some uh churches some evangelical and and i don't mean to uh, it may not be the be evangelical but some more, more of the um sort of conservative movements that believe that um you know in holy warriors and so you know what i recall growing up with was a church that prayed for peace yes. that prayed for politicians in a very different way than i see um being the uh the kind of noisy religious rhetoric that seems to have meshed with a certain component of our political lives um and that that saddens me um but uh it is why i've always loved grace it's why i love the episcopal church when i go <laughs> it's not as regularly as i should um here in here in Boston and uh, and what it stands for, yeah. yeah. Charles Lawrence's father was the first African American um, president of the House of Deputies. Uh, yeah, so he's like I don't know, like the Speaker of the House version of the Episcopal Church. Um, such a prominent yeah. family too. His 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 sisters, as you probably know. Quite remarkable. And I used to go to St. John the Divine when I was in. Oh, New I York. love it there. Two great yeah. places. You know, you have um, in all the notes that they gave me to prepare for our meeting today, they told me that you're working on so many different projects. Um, one is the Talking Helix, another is Gathering the Ghosts, and another is on a documentary on killing unarmed citizens like Trayvon Martin. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about any of those projects or, or some things that you're working on that excite you these days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the I, I did do a piece which, you know, it, it evokes my my sadness to think of. I did a piece called um, Skittles's Metaphor, and I think that's the title of it. It's in a, in a, it, was, it was actually a journal piece. It's it, it's in a, it's in a journal called Theory and Event from Johns Hopkins University, and it was about the litany, the litany the repeated. It's almost it is almost like a you know our national chorus, our Greek chorus of mourning. You know, he reached for his gun. I was in fear for my life. Wow. You know, it's the thing that Tyree Nichols's officers in that tape, you know, hear them recuperating. Well, what really happened? Oh, he reached for my gun. You know, it, 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 this is the Rodney King, the same thing that's happened over and over and over again. And uh, whether it's a learned litany or whether it's a repeated lit litany, um, it is a litany of of, of, of of tragedy and very interrelated with the thinking that's behind the proliferation of stand your ground laws, yes. which so disproportionately license the killing of minorities or people who are not perceived to have ground to stand on. <laughs> and the thing about, about stand your ground laws is that they really make public sidewalks, public streets, a kind of privatized ground and then say, you know, if you know, if somebody threatens you in that space which you have declared your ground, um, then it is your subjective fear, not a normative fear, not a reasonable fear, but your subjective fear that allows you to protect yourself. And that means we're really back to the days of cowboy justice or vigilante justice. And um, and 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 so that's so that's what that piece was about the reiteration of all these killings that um supplant public safety with private notions of you know i shoot first and ask questions later um that's an ethic of that seems to have replaced a presumption of innocence yes the uh and i appreciate fear i appreciate danger but you know all of that, you know, stand your ground laws do not replace gun control. And the fact that so much of why we are afraid and walking down the street has to do with, you know, automatic weapons and more guns than people. So that's one. The other thing that I'm really concerned about is the reinstantiation of certain kinds of 
what Ruha Benjamin has titled, you know, the new Jim Code, mm -hmm. that we are being, that our data is being picked up and aggregated and in ways that we can't speak back to because it's largely in black boxes or proprietary. And so algorithmic assortments are something that arrange our lives, give us feeds, inform us in very particular ways that are um, reinforcing of uh, previous actions rather than allowing us to explore without the um, without this sense of being guided down a particular runnel of where we have been before and things like that. And so I think it, there's a kind of what some in media studies have called homophily of, you know, you get what you already like, and then it becomes tighter and tighter and tighter in terms of your system of reference. And you become less exposed to the entire creative universe of human, of human thinking. And all you see is the same thing. And this, this I think, has resulted in something like cultic thinking or, you know, um, superstition, if all you're seeing is a reinforcement of even the silliest notions that crossed your mind, then, then you end up with things like QAnon. Um, and so I think that we, we are living through a technological revolution, and it's ungoverned and to some extent ungovernable. Um, because it is owned by private companies that do not have public interest necessarily um, um, at their center. It's it's for profit. Um, and that's that's going to be a problem that we definitely have to, you know, whose consequences we're, we're already. Uh, yeah, so I, I had so many questions I wanted to ask you about technology. And, you know, we talked a little bit about um, just, you know, part of the problem with the Florida and the banning books is just doing it on such a massive scale. I, I, I often talk about, um, you know, the treatment of witches, like after the invention of the printing press, it wasn't this tiny local phenomena, it was like a global phenomena. And, uh, and, and so the book banning is, is employing these new technologies too. Yeah, and facial recognition, for example, you may have heard about uh, the owner of Madison Square Garden. Yes, I have. Um, yeah. um, for something or other, I, it's but lawyers. Yeah, yeah, and so he's barred any of the lawyers in that firm. And so this woman got a birthday gift to go to the Knicks game, and she's a member of that firm, not necessarily on this team. But facial recognition barred her at the gate, and it's that kind of private, privatized exclusion that vitiates the civil rights notion of public accommodation, regardless of race. It seems yeah. to me that we are, re, you know, we're, we're if, if race is a kind of genre at, at heart, it's not just about color. We could reinscribe it to be about all lawyers from this firm. You know, who, right, you completely. Know, not welcome. And it may as well be, you know, you know, a separate water fountain for them. And, yes. you know, and, and the technology makes these new forms of, constriction, restriction, less than public accommodation, um, uh, steering and hiring, um, uh, not only a palpable consequence, but very hard to trace and to identify if you don't even know what's happening. Yeah. I, I, I'm so disappointed, um, Professor Williams, that our time is, is, uh, is out. I, I had so many more questions. I just asked you like 20% of the questions that occurred to me. Um, your work has meant so much to me and to Heidi. Um, and we're so grateful for, for for what you're doing. And I know you're really on the front lines. And I know that um, the, 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 you've received a lot of um, terrible attention from the far right. Um, but I, I want to just thank you for what you're doing to 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 build, you know, what churches call the kingdom of God, the realm of God. Um, but but that ideal of, of us begin to be able to really see each other for who we are and really encounter each other. Um, so thank you very much for your your ministry to all of us um, through through your work. Malcolm, it is such a delight to see you. It's such a delight to have reconnected with Heidi. And um, as lapsed as I am, the one thing I do retain from my from our religious upbringing is a sense of faith. And um, it has been such a gift to me to be able to speak with you uh, tonight. Uh, it's it's a it's it's been a pure joy. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, and for everyone else, um, please join us uh, on Sunday. We're going to be in, in person for the forum at 9.30 a.m. 
When my guest will be the St. Augustine scholar, Margaret Miles. She was the first tenured faculty um, member at Harvard Divinity School as a woman. She'll be talking about some exciting new findings she's discovered while writing what may be her last book. We rely on your support for the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can give online at gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK, T-H-I-N-K, to 76278. And thank you again um, to Professor Pat Williams. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll look forward to the next time we our paths cross. My pleasure. Take care. Lovely to see you. Yes.